We can't warn people of an approaching earthquake like we can a hurricane, but scientists seem to have found a correlation between a slowdown in the Earth's rotation and increased earthquakes. We can't feel it, but the Earth is spinning at about a thousand miles per hour, depending on where you're standing on the globe. But this rotational speed isn't constant, and earthquakes just might have a hand in that. The 2004 earthquake in Indonesia sped up the Earth's rotation by about three microseconds. Too small for anybody to notice without sensitive instruments, but that earthquake made our days just a tiny bit shorter. But just as earthquakes can affect the Earth's rotation, the Earth's rotation seems to have a connection with the frequency of earthquakes. Over the past four years, the Earth's rotation has been slowing down. That means our days and nights have been slightly longer, by fractions of a second, but it's enough that could have an effect on the frequency of earthquakes. Scientists have observed this slowdown periodically. It happens about every 30 years. They're not exactly sure why this slowdown happens, but they have a theory. The Earth's core rotates like the Earth itself, but the outer layer of the core is liquid. Every so often, this outer layer gets hung up on the solid mantle surrounding it. This causes the rotation of the core to slow down. Consequently, the rotation of the entire planet is affected, and we see a slowdown. And after about five years of slowing down, the Earth tends to experience an increase in earthquakes. You could think of the Earth like a spinning record. If you put your finger on it, the record slows down. Pressure builds until you release your finger, and the thing suddenly jolts forward. That jolt is an earthquake, or a number of earthquakes happening all over the planet. Now, this is just a correlation scientists have observed. It doesn't necessarily mean that the Earth's rotation and the frequency of earthquakes are directly related. But if they are, it might give scientists an ability to forecast earthquakes like we forecast the weather. And if they're right, 2018 will be an unusually active year for earthquakes. People have been trying to forecast earthquakes for a long time now. Over the centuries, people looked to animals, meteors, even cloud formations to predict the onset of an earthquake. But most of these stories are anecdotal and rely on a misunderstanding of how earthquakes actually work. In the 1970s, scientists were confident that they would have a reliable method of earthquake forecasting in no time. But by the 1990s, no such method had been found. But that doesn't mean earthquake forecasting is impossible. Today, forecasting an earthquake generally relies on long-term trends that often lead to increased earthquake activity, like the slowing of the Earth's rotation. The Earth is made up of tectonic plates that are always moving past each other or running into one another, exceedingly slow most of the time. But as one plate butts up against another, stresses build up, deforming the surrounding rock. This deformation weakens the rock layer and it eventually breaks, like putting constant pressure on a pencil. The wood bends until the stresses become too much for the pencil to handle, and it breaks. In that moment of breakage, all that energy is released. The two pieces slip past each other, moving very fast for a short period of time. This is an earthquake. But scientists can identify these areas of deformation, where pressure is building up in the Earth's crust, and identify areas that are at risk for an earthquake. Because the Earth's plates are always moving in a steady manner, the buildup and release of this pressure should happen on a regular basis, in similar areas around the globe. That means earthquakes are cyclical, and could be forecasted. But attempts to do this have been met with failure. Scientists identified one such earthquake cycle in the Parkfield segment of the San Andreas Fault in California. With observational data going all the way back to 1857, scientists noticed that earthquakes happen about every 22 years in this area. Knowing this, they predicted another earthquake would hit sometime between 1988 or 1993. But it didn't. An earthquake didn't hit that segment until 2004. They were over a decade off. For now, earthquake forecasting remains in its early stages. The ability to predict an earthquake is still out of reach, but we can identify areas and conditions where earthquakes will be most likely. This knowledge can help those within the affected areas better prepare by building earthquake-resistant buildings, stockpiling supplies, and training emergency earthquake response teams. While we may not know when or where the next earthquake will hit, we can limit the damage they cause by not being caught off guard when it eventually does happen, whether that's tomorrow or 10 years from now. So we're all on Earth right now, moving in the direction of its rotation. Just how fast are you moving because of that? And is someone in, say, Chicago moving at the same speed as someone at the equator? And why would two people on the same planet be moving at different speeds? If these sound like the kind of questions you'd like to explore, check out Brilliant.org. 
Brilliant is a problem-solving website that teaches you to think like a scientist. If you want to think like the scientists who study earthquakes, check out Brilliant's Physics of the Everyday course. They have an on-the-field section there that can help you learn more about the motion and momentum that we experience every day here on Earth. Think about this for a moment. Your speed on the surface of the Earth is due to the Earth's angular velocity. But the Earth isn't the only object that can have angular velocity. You too can rotate. And if you're a gymnast, you might be rotating a lot and therefore generating a lot of angular velocity. And your size or effective diameter affects your angular velocity. So why is short stature an advantage in professional gymnastics? Is it because smaller athletes can perform faster rotations when they are moving across the floor more slowly? Or do smaller athletes require less energy to set their bodies into rotation? Or do smaller athletes tend to have higher strength to mass ratio? Or is it all of the above? Well, you'll just have to go to brilliant.org to find out the answer. Brilliant takes concepts like these, breaks them up into bite-sized problems, present it in a clear, thought-provoking manner, and then builds back up to an interesting conclusion. They have courses covering a variety of subjects, from the physics of gymnastics, to the surrealistic wonder of geometry, to astronomy and games of chance. To help support The Good Stuff and learn more about Brilliant, go to brilliant.org slash thegoodstuff and sign up for free. The first 200 people who click on that link will get 20% off the annual premium subscription. So have fun thinking like a scientist, and thanks for watching.